And the seminar series was one of the early developments um, that we put into place in the centre. Can I just check how many people in this room have been to any of our seminars in our seminar series? Great. Good. Well, I hope that some of what I'm going to say will uh, resonate with um, what you remember. Um, and I do apologise if I miss out any of your favourite seminars, but inevitably this is a rather selective take through it. Um, the seminar series has been developed in collaboration with the International Futures Forum and has been masterminded by their converger, Andrew Lyon. Um, and our thanks really go to him for this terrific resource. The very first seminar was delivered by AC Grayling on the 25th of November 2004. And he spoke on the subject of imagine the perfect polis creating health in the city. Now, this was not a move into the Glasgow vernacular from the outset. <laughs> the polis in question was the city state and within it an active citizenry. The most recent seminar was delivered just a week ago by Professor James Curran, chief executive of SIPA. And he talked on the title, In an Ideal World, Traffic Lights Should Always Be Green. Um, a fairly scary thought, I would think, for the traffic police, but never mind. Um, and that was the 50th seminar in our ninth seminar series. And between these two, we've heard from economists, philosophers, historians, geographers, meteorologists, public health academics, other academics, youth workers, members of the creative industries, campaigners and others. And here are just um, an illustration. Uh, some of them uh, are in this room um, and others you may recognise from elsewhere. I'm not going to go through them all, but summaries and transcripts and podcasts from all of these seminars are on our website. Um, and those from the latest series have also been filmed. Um, it is a fantastic resource, I think actually a unique resource um, in terms of um, perspectives on health um, and I really thoroughly recommend it to you. So in my time this afternoon I'm cutting through 50 hours of seminars um, to create a 50 minute talk. Inevitably it's rather a selective path um, but I'm going to draw out two sets of issues. The first set of issues relate to the context in which we're living and working and the second set to some direct implications for what we do in the Glasgow Centre. And my starting point is to place where we are in historical and geographical context. We heard from a number of speakers about how beliefs, knowledge and ideas have developed throughout history. And one dominant theme concerned the relationship between human society and the environment. Geoffrey Bolton reminded us that human beings are neither the centre nor the pinnacle of creation, nor are the Earth's resources available infinitely for human benefit. Extreme events have happened before and will happen again. We have to treat the earth with respect. And these themes came to life again in 2011 when Phil Hanlon took us on three journeys. Well, he didn't actually, he does like us. He didn't actually take us on the journeys with him, but he described three journeys um, that he'd undertaken on sabbatical to explore past, present and future consciousness. And he referred back to Plato's belief that humans instinctively integrate things that are good, things that are true, and things that are beautiful in their daily living. And he argued that the modern world has resulted in some of this integration falling apart. Maureen O'Hara also described an increasingly complex, <coughs> uncertain and rapidly changing world. And one in which, wherever we are, we're affected by global trends such as overpopulation, global warming, ethnic conflict, and a decline in biodiversity. In short, she said, we need to learn how to live and work in this context. Our current frameworks often won't fit. And Maureen highlighted for us the harmful consequences on mental well-being of this complexity and uncertainty. And bringing this matter closer to home, in his analysis of the recent transformation of Scotland, Tom Devine argued that over the past 25 years, Scotland has undergone a remarkable series of changes, including the emergence of a new range of occupations, greater social mobility, radical alteration in family structure, explosion in car ownership and home ownership, and new levels of affluence. 
He concluded, however, that this transformation seems to have resulted in a more divided Scotland. Although, as you'll probably already have realised, ours is not a traditional public health seminar series, um, a number of seminars have looked at the issue of inequalities in health and their persistence. Bruce Link has published widely on the thesis that there are fundamental social causes of health status. He came to talk to us in December 2007. His thesis is that people in different socioeconomic groups have differential access to social resources such as power, money, knowledge, education and beneficial social connections. These resources can be used flexibly over time and space and come into play whatever the health issue and whatever the risk factor of concern. They operate at an individual level and they also operate to provide access to health supporting contexts such as better neighbourhoods, better occupational conditions and so on. One consequence of this is that where the preventability of a disease is low or evidence of effective treatment exists, or if evidence of effective treatment is weak, there will be little difference between the more affluent and the less affluent in society in terms of their health outcomes. But where preventability is high or there are known treatments that are effective for a condition, those who have resources deploy them and are thereby able to achieve a better outcome. Bruce Link concluded that we need both to achieve a more equal distribution of these resources in society, both financial resources and social resources, and also to put in place policies that are good for the population as a whole, things that people don't need resources to buy into, but just enable everyone to have a better quality of life. In all but the first of our nine seminar series, we've included a focus on the biological consequences of poverty. I've listed the speakers here under the heading, How Stress Gets Under the Skin. And within this stream of seminars, we've learned about the psychobiological processes that occur in response to external stresses and about how small biological responses have a cumulative impact over the years. The importance of consistent, comprehensible early years experiences were emphasised, as were the beneficial effects as having control over decisions that affect you and of having social support and taking part in physical activity. Lastly, by means of context, there have been important inputs about the nature of modern culture and the stories that we tell about the sort of world that we live in. And I'm going to just highlight two different takes on this for you. First, Oliver James spoke to us about affluenza and selfish capitalism, building up the case that by placing too high a value on the material aspects of life, English-speaking nations put themselves at twice the risk of mental disorder of their European counterparts. The overemphasis on materialism results in an underemphasis on other fundamental human needs. What's needed, he argued, is a reinvigoration of public goods rather than private goods for a few. And Eleanor Yule, the filmmaker and director, took us through representations of Scottish culture on film. She contrasted two dominant portrayals the miserableism of films like uh, Train Spotting, Sweet Sixteen and Red Road, and what she called the sugar-coated tartan of Brigger Doon, Whiskey Galore, Braveheart, Local Hero and so on. She argued though that miserableism has become a commodity, it sells well in the entertainment industry and it will continue to be a way in which Scotland is represented unless we can find a third approach, one which projects hope, um, both in our society and also in our film representations of it. And I think that resonates with Susan's point about belief, um, people feeling that they have some belief in them and belief in the future. Now there's a lot more that could be gleaned from the seminars about the context of our work, but I want to move on to focus on some themes with evident implications for what the centre does. 
we're already responding to some of these themes and you're going to recognise quite a lot of resonances to things that have been already said uh, throughout the day and indeed comments from the audience. So this gives me reassurance that um, these are themes that people might think are a good way forward. Um, and then, as I said, Robert's going to speak briefly about our strategy in the next session. So returning first to Maureen O'Hara, she presented the challenge of finding the transformative response to the complex, changing circumstances described earlier. The transformative response is contrasted to these two other responses. The first involving simply digging into established ways of doing things. The second feeling that it's all too difficult um, and almost giving up. And I think we'll all have seen examples of both of these in our working life. The characteristics of the transformative response are shown in pink at the bottom of the slide here. And I'm going to refer back to these now as I go on. Several of our speakers, as has David just recently and others of you today, have emphasised the importance of taking a systems perspective, recognising that population health is an emergent property of a system comprising of the wide range of determinants of health, which interact in often not entirely predictable ways. When David came to speak to us in our seminar series in 2007, he made us think about the public health system, describing it as having a crisis of confidence at that stage. And in our final session last season, Sandro Galea, who holds the chair of epidemiology in Columbia University in New York, urged us to be aware of the inferential mistakes that arise from oversimplification. He also stated that public health is behind other disciplines in adopting a systems perspective in his work. And that's a challenge that we may want to rise to. But I particularly like to highlight the late Max Boiseau's insights from his experiences at CERN, working with a team of scientists at the Large Hadron Collider. And I know that Max's seminar made a significant impact on the people who heard it. He described these three different forms of knowledge the experiential, what we see, hear, feel, smell, touch. The narrative, the stories that we tell about that. And the abstract, symbolic type of knowledge, which is codified and summarised and aggregated above those experiential and narrative forms. He also talked about the importance of distributed decision making and about the role of boundary objects around which people can coalesce and which help to create some sort of more manageable order within a more chaotic system. We're recognising particularly this need to build up these different forms of knowledge about Glasgow's health. Um, and in the back of my mind are the words of another seminar series speaker, Jim Scott, who argued that an abstract navigation system is ideal for guiding the ship over the high seas, but you need the more local embedded knowledge of the river pilot to bring it to port. Um, and I imagine that that local embedded knowledge is equally important in terms of bringing a less healthy population up to better health. In our third ever seminar, Shalom Glauberman told us this. We continue to pursue the belief that if only we had all the information, we could figure everything out. Um, the need to build capacity for dealing with the non-forecastable as well as the more predictable is one of the challenges we collectively face as we move forward. Now, the team at the centre has worked hard from the outset to create a place where multiple stories can be heard and different perspectives on an issue can be held at the same time. I should emphasise this is not an anything goes position. Um, rather, it's one that recognises by looking at an issue through different lenses, um, we might manage to see a new way forward. Um, and also that there will be multiple truths on any problem that we confront. It also recognises that previously dominant mindsets haven't led to the health improvement that we're seeking. There are some specific suggestions from the seminar series that we're seeking to put in place to generate different perspectives. These are also all routes to shifting power imbalances in decision making. They include the civic conversation, which we initiated in 2005, use of creative imagination design processes to create a different sort of conversation between organisations and communities, the wisdom circle approach that's been used in Germany to enable large scale population decisions to be made in a more democratic way, 
and the positive deviance approach that the Sternins came and talked to us about. We're also convinced about the need to pay more attention to two broad issues. The importance of bounce back ability emerged in early seminars from biological as well as from philosophical perspectives. And it was further developed by Tony Hodgson in May 2011, when he argued that a new approach to resilience is required, bouncing beyond the status quo rather than just to back where we were before something like the recession happened. And Anthony Morgan's discussion of the asset-based approach to health improvement emphasised salutogenesis, which, as Harry has just said, takes us to thinking about how to create a truly healthy population, not just address the health gap, which is usually, ironically, defined in terms of illness or mortality. The importance of social connectedness, social inclusion, social capital and social cohesion have been evident in several of our seminars and also emerged from a number of the GCPH work programmes, uh, the GoWell programme, which we haven't talked about today, SOBID, the Three Cities work and others. And we'll seek to learn about the sorts of interventions and approaches that support the social and we'll be working with others to better understand the health impacts of those. We'll also pay attention to the boundary between the physical and the social. And this point was very clearly illustrated in our second seminar series by Howard Frumpkin. Um, here's one illustration. He was emphasising the impact of a car accessible society. Um, so here we have uh, drive through fast food places. We eat uh, just in our car. We drive along and we go away. Drive through coffee houses. Um, both of these sort of images are familiar to us, um, but drive through trees um, and even drive through weddings, what surely should be one of the most social events in our lives um, now in Las Vegas can just be done in your car. Um, so in conclusion, then, I want to return to the central challenge that we face collectively and that we're really grappling with at the centre. And that challenge is how to find ways to successfully address long-standing problems in our 21st century context, recognising that the future is uncertainty. Geoffrey Wigand at the bottom here uh, came to speak to us in our third series. He took on the US tobacco industry for covering up evidence about the damaging effects of tobacco. As a result, he was threatened, taken to court, his marriage fell apart, his health deteriorated, um, and so I guess I'm hesitant about building that approach into staff <laughs> objectives for the next year. Um, although advocacy for action is something we should be doing in the centre where the evidence is clear. We have, however, built into our development processes Phil Hanlon's recommendations for the good, the true and the beautiful as an organising framework for public health. And also the Three Horizon model developed by our IFF colleagues which reminds us that those issues and processes and structures that are dominant in the present will not always be dominant. They will tail off and others will become the dominant issues and structures in the future. Our challenge, therefore, is not only to work on those issues that we see around us today, but also to identify the shoots of those that are going to become important in the future and really work to foster them. Thanks very much.